Steam locomotives in miniature at the Steam Workshop. This is part 8. Working on a 5 inch gauge steam locomotive, fitting the water pump and the suspension. In this clip I'm applying some oil to the centre hole in the ram of the water pump. Please note, as I mentioned in the last episode, never use motor oil or general purpose lubricants where silicone rubber is concerned. But as there's no silicone rubber at all on this cross pin, I can use ordinary lubricating oil. Originally this cross pin just had a couple of split pins fitted to hold it in place, but I'm making it better than that, I'm using a washer at each side for something for the split pin to bear against. Not wishing to be picky, I used a galvanised washer, mainly because I found a whole box full of them. This clip shows the mechanical principle of the operation of the water pump. Quite clever, very neat and it fits in a very small space. Which actually reminds me of a girlfriend I used to have. Anyway, enough of the girlfriend jokes, it's too early. It's such a long time since I worked on miniature steam locomotives, I've forgotten some of the terminology. What I'm currently doing is bolting in place a horn stay. And to clarify it, just in case you're having difficulty understanding what I'm saying with my Yorkshire dialect, here's the spelling on screen. This horn stay, sometimes known as a horn keep, because it keeps the bottoms of the horn together, and the horn is the casting that's bolted to the frames that is the bearing surface for the axle box. And the horn stay is also the main support for the suspension. Pretty much like this. The two springs fit over the two studs, followed by a metal plate that's fitted to the top of the springs using a couple of nuts. Or should I say the bottom of the springs because the engine is upside down. You have to tighten these nuts against the pressure of the springs and I find my fingers are not strong enough so I use a socket driver and now I'm also using the socket driver to drive a socket and this allows me to tighten the nuts on top of the springs. In this clip I'm testing the suspension and to be perfectly honest these springs are a little bit on the strong side for an engine of this size and weight. And also, as you can see here, the axle is locked in position. But that's only because it's not mounted at the other side, the side you can't really see on camera. With suspension this stiff on such a small engine, it's going to derail, and there is evidence in the past of it having derailed many times. I mentioned about the damage to the original lock nuts that held the springs in place in the last video. So I am going to make one or two modifications to the suspension to make it more flexible. But at this stage, I'm just showing how you fit the suspension together. I'm going to use two locking compounds. This one is to lock the nuts onto the shafts. And this one is a retaining compound. And this is to retain the shafts in the axle boxes. Never put nuts on shafts using retaining compound. This is just thread locker. And this should be used to help prevent the nuts from working loose due to vibration. The other stuff, the retaining compound, is also known as stud locker. And this is largely designed to hold studs in place so they don't work loose, but it's much more permanent than the thread locker. A nut applied with thread locker is very easy to remove, you just unspanner it. But if you use retaining compounds such as Loctite 603, 601, etc. and all the other variants, it's far more difficult to remove the nut. You may even have to resort to applying heat to the part which could be difficult if it's in a place where all the paint is going to burn away. In this clip I'm just applying some touch-up paint to the top of the nuts just to stop them from going rusty. Not entirely necessary, but it finishes the job off. This highly speeded up clip shows me very quickly fitting the keeper plate to the springs on the other side of the axle. And now both of them are on, everything's spinning freely, but the suspension is far too solid. I'll leave it as it is for now, but I will alter this before the engine's finished. In this clip I'm lubricating the ram of the axle driven pump and I'm bolting it into position on the stretcher between the frames. Being wise after the event, what I should have done is mounted the pump in between the frames with the pump and eccentric fully assembled and then put the axle in, but no, I did it the hard way. And in this clip I'm mounting the pump to the stretcher with a couple of 4BA bolts. These are new 4BA nuts and bolts so they're going together very easily. I'm using a socket at one end and my trusty Barco spanner to hold the nut at the other end. So far this rebuild has been quite straightforward, far easier than when I took it apart, and a lot cleaner. All I have to do now is feed the cross pin into position, fit the other washer and split pin, and then apply some oil to all of the moving parts. In the final part of this sequence I'm reassembling the eccentric, and I'm using a 4BA nut and bolt at each side. And finally I test the component. You can see exactly how it works as I rotate the wheels. Nothing is binding, everything is very free. I just hope the rest of the engine rebuild goes as well as this part. I think it's time to see what John's doing. 
I'm hoping to make this section a regular feature of the Steam Workshop videos, and it's called Taking Model Engineering to the Next Level with John at the Steam Workshop. John's currently working on several projects, and this is one of them. This is a tender for a Duke of Gloucester steam locomotive. And this is an example of John's riveting skills. This is what happens when John does some riveting. Following closely the full-size design, these rivets are much flatter than normal on the outside. On a first look, this is not too remarkable until you look at the other side. And for the inside of the tender, the part that no one ever sees, the rivets are a different shape entirely. John's used a standard rivet snap to form the heads on the rivets on the inside of the tank. If I'd have been doing this riveting job, I would have just flattened over the heads on the inside of the tank, because who's going to see the riveting inside the tank? But this is what separates people like me and people like John. If you watch these videos, you will see that I usually make quite a good job of things, but John does take it to the next level. This is perfection. And while on the subject of perfection, this is an engine that John's currently working on. He didn't build it, he's restoring it. And just look at this, model engineering as it should be done, in an ideal world. This locomotive is fitted with Caprotti valve gear, which is very complicated. I've put the spelling on screen so you can Google it and have a look what it's all about. This is part of the mechanism, just look how it works, mind-blowing. Anyway, back to reality. In this clip I'm going to show something that I didn't show when I put the front axle in place. The suspension on this engine was far too tight, so I drilled out every one of these horn stays so that the studs don't bind against the hole, which is one of the things that was happening originally. Pointless having these holes very small because the wheels have to be able to do this. Can you see what's happening? There has to be some articulation in the way that the axle boxes fit in the horn blocks, not front to back articulation, side to side. Miniature railway tracks are generally worse than full size for being uneven, although that's not always the case, and the wheels need to be able to pop up and down and drop into the hollows. And if this articulation is not present, or the suspension is too stiff, if the engine hits a bump in the track or a slight depression, it's going to come off the track. When I work on things like this, I can soon get into the mindset of the builder, and there are some fundamental things with this engine that I need to put right. Damage that I found underneath the suspension was quite severe and confirms that the engine must have come off the track quite a lot of times. So just to recap, I drilled out the horn stays so they don't foul the studs anymore and I'm going to fit some weaker springs. It's always amazed me how much steam locomotives really are a mechanical anomaly. I mean look at this one. It looks to me, before this engine was put into storage, where it suffered very badly, someone had had a quick go at redoing the rods. The coupling rod is a very tight fit on the rear crank pin. I'm going to try and illustrate this by fitting the coupling rod to the crank pin. Look, this is far too tight. I mean, it's a bearing fit and it would be fine in an internal combustion engine, but it's the last thing you want for a coupling rod. This would prevent any articulation. If both of the rods were held together, how is it going to go over the bumps and how is it going to go around the corner? It has to be able to do this. I can only speak from my experience, I never try and speculate. Miniature steam locomotives need the suspension and the rods to have a bit of free movement. I need to pack up the axle box so I can fit the springs. To pack up the front axle I use part of the water pump but that's now bolted to the frame stretcher so I can't do that. So I'm using my Barco spanner, as it's just about the right thickness to lift up the axle box sufficiently to allow me to fit the springs. I'm not going to labour this point because the principle is identical to fit in the front pair of axles. One viewer commented, you keep saying the same thing. Well yeah I do, because on stationary engines things are generally done in pairs and depending on how many wheels the steam locomotive has, a lot of the processes are repeated many times. So I thought that was a pretty stupid comment. I think the daftest comment I've had for a long time is, oh you've got dirty hands. What an astute observation from a highly intelligent viewer. So in the meantime, I will continue to have dirty hands for these dirty jobs, and I will continue to repeat the processes so I can show me fitting the back axle. By the way, all comments on this channel come to me first, so I decide whether they go on the channel. Also, I never allow links. Send me links by all means if you want me to see something, hopefully something of interest, but any comments that come in with general links are not allowed on the channel. And why do I do this? Well, it's my channel, so I'll do what I like. No, that's not strictly the right answer. 
The reason that I don't let links onto the channel is for two reasons. One is links can be dangerous and take viewers to the wrong place on the internet. And the other reason is when people are trying to advertise themselves on my channel. I advertise Blackgate's engineering frequently, and there's nothing financial in it, they're just good friends of mine. I occasionally put an advert on for my friend Chris at 21st Century Steam, and you will see me using his steam engine fittings on quite a lot of my videos. Not forgetting Steam Workshop, I advertise Steam Workshop because I'm doing work for them. And that's it for this episode, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.